In 1966, I commenced a career in national parks, which spanned 32 years. We took up residence in a new house at West Head on the Lambert Peninsula, overlooking Broken Bay. One of the things I took responsibility for was the care and management of the area's extensive Aboriginal legacy, principally art sites, but also occupation deposits and other relics like stone arrangements. Many of the flat rock outcrops in the area bore engravings of a huge range of subjects, many of which could be interpreted in a general sense, but many could not. First impressions were of art that was crude in execution, but I learned that the figures were not an attempt at a portrayal in the same sense that a photograph is. The figures were merely a reminder of characters in a story. We don't have the stories, so we are left with meaningless images. I became very involved with this artwork to the extent of searching for figures and galleries at night with a lantern. The low oblique light made the often shallow grooves much more easily seen because they were shadowed. At times the work of a particular artist could be recognised. I found human figures with bumps on the knees and elbows on Lambert Peninsula and then later found similar figures in Brisbane Waters National Park on the other side of Broken Bay. Or perhaps the figures represented the same character shown by different artists, a character who happened to have lumps on the knees and elbows. We will never know. Some galleries are very extensive, comprising dozens of figures. Other times they were solitary like this echidna figure. Or this alternative quite different echidna. Occasionally the images were on a vertical surface, like these in a cave on Cowan Creek. Predictably, perhaps, there were many depictions of fish and the occasional shark. One gallery near Topham Trigg had a large number of fish with a shark, as seen in their scale drawing of the group. Occasionally we would guess that a figure represented some ancestral hero like this one near Cottage Point, which had horns on its head, a shield and other implements, perhaps one being an axe. These two huge ancestral heroes were also near Cottage Point, about a kilometre west of Tabor Trigg. The juxtaposition of subjects was at times curious, like shields and fish together. A group in Brisbane Waters has two birds, possibly penguins, with eel figures and fish. One in Brisbane Waters National Park shows two individuals, each with a fish in one hand and a boomerang in the other. One of those individuals displays both male and female attributes and the knobs on the knees. Whale figures were very common. This gallery shows two apparently side by side. Another shows a human figure within the whale outline. In this gallery there is a kangaroo figure and what appears to be a seal. The gallery has also perhaps a dozen or so plain circles about 600 millimetres in diameter. Many engravings were very deeply cut and have survived well. These figures on a vertical surface on Cowan Creek are only a metre or so above the water. This figure with rayed hair or headdress is quite unrecognisable, 
presumably representing some ancestral or mythological character. A particular favourite of mine was this character on the America Bay track, with a stylized kangaroo head, fore limb, hind limb, and a recognisably kangaroo-like penis, said to be piddling in the pothole. There is a circle with a tail-like attachment, possibly representing a stingray, or perhaps not. Fish, a boomerang, footprint outlines, and other subjects are fairly recognisable. It would be interesting to speculate that since no one has actually seen an entity from mythology, the artist would be free to represent it in any way he chose. A side-on view figure wasn't a common approach. Perhaps this represents someone engaged in an emu dance, hence the emu-like butt. This image has nine appendages, perhaps an octopus. Sex was a topic from time to time, as seen in this pair near Salvation Creek. A more complex story is this one at Muagamara. Two principal characters were clearly in Congress. What is especially interesting is that both figures, but particularly the female, have holes drilled in the body, suggesting they had been speared in retribution for sexual misconduct. None of the other figures on the site have holes. An early manager at the reserve, perhaps 10 years before I took this picture, was offended by the images and covered them up with soil and leaves, which almost resulted in the figures rotting away. I found them by accident and cleaned them off, which is why the rock is a pale colour. Engravings are often found partially covered by encroaching moss, and this leaches acid which quickly erodes the surface and destroys the engraving. This was the case with this figure I rescued near Duffy's forest. Part of the figure was almost lost. Here is another side-on figure, also at Moorgamurra. It has been interpreted to represent a koala character. Some galleries are very dispersed, and difficult to photograph, like this group near Belrose Road, Terry Hills. It features the only lyrebird-like image I ever found, though there may be others. Occasionally engravings appeared with artefacts, like this bird figure with the stone arrangements. Stone arrangements were made, but sites like this are so old we have no contemporary evidence that they were actually of Aboriginal assembly. The other obvious art form is cave painting. Again, the execution of the subjects appears crude, and we have no idea of their meaning, if any. Unlike the sophisticated paintings of places like Arnhem Land, New South Wales art was mostly monochromatic. These paintings have also suffered badly with the passing of time and many are very faint. Charcoal was a common tool for these drawings, often apparently just executed with a fire stick without any binder matrix like gum or fat. In some cases silicon has leached from the rock and filmed over part of the drawings even to the extent of partially obscuring them. Regrettably, many caves where these drawings occur have been visited by Europeans. Names are often scratched, marked with charcoal, or even chiselled into the cave wall. A common form of painting is, of course, hand stencils. Were they another way of saying, I was here? like the more modern graffiti and scrawled initials on prominent walls. Occasionally, stencils of other things like boomerangs were present, 
that are really sore any. One nice little group comprised a snake and a wallaby in black, with six human figures in red superimposed. They were extremely faint in the 1960s in a cave at Waratah Bay, north of Bobbin Head. Another interesting little group was of five little emus, about 160 millimetres high near West Head. They were in a tiny overhang, less than a metre high and very close to the ground. Perhaps ground levels had changed significantly since the paintings were done. At Wilton, there is a fine gallery of figures all done in black. It has been badly vandalised with visitor names in charcoal. I managed to clean off most of the graffiti on my visit without damaging the paintings, which seem to be protected either by the natural cave processes of silica glazing, or perhaps the charcoal had been mixed with some sort of fixative by the artists. There were about five complete or partial kangaroos, a human figure holding two boomerangs, another holding unidentifiable implements, another holding a spear and axe, and other human-shaped figures, one being very large and lying prone. There were also two warriors with shields and a club. Fighting pairs seem to be a common theme, as in this similar pair from Cobar in western New South Wales. There are very extensive galleries at Mount Grenfell near Cobar. Human figures with shields and clubs are very common. The galleries have white and red figures often superimposed. After my visit in the late 60s, the cave was enclosed with wire mesh to prevent wild goats inhabiting the cave and rubbing up against the paintings and damaging them. Of course, if the galleries originally had stories associated with them, it would be impossible now to know or interpret them. This reminds me, though, of an incident in Karingai Chase National Park. A television series on Skippy the Bush Kangaroo was being filmed there, and the producers had brought in Aborigines from Northern Australia for a particular story. Whilst they were there, one was doing paintings on stringy bark slabs. They were typical Northern Territory style and looked quite interesting. Being aware that art was generally tied to a story rather than just a pretty picture, I asked the head man what the story was behind a picture being executed. I had caught him unawares. He didn't know how to answer. He finally said, See Roy, see Roy. And the message was clear. The painting was meaningless, but if you want a story, Roy should be able to supply one, especially if it meant a sale. It rather spoilt it for me. My interest and enthusiasm for Aboriginal culture lasted for some time. I visited art sites in many places, including Mootwingy and Sturt's Meadows, which have extensive galleries of intaglio engravings, pecked into very hard rock surfaces. Though Mootwingy and Sturt's Meadows areas are not that far apart in our terms, they were obviously inhabited by different groups, as can be seen in the choice of subjects for the engravings. The figures at Mootwingy are dominated by naturalistic subjects like emus, kangaroos, humans, whereas those at Sturt's Meadows, which was private property, appeared to be more abstract. All of these pictures were taken 40 plus years ago on 35mm film, which I recently scanned. Unfortunately, they weren't in very good condition. <laughs>